All right, good evening and welcome to BI 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview. We are nearing the end of our course that is brought to you by the New Covenant College here at the New Testament Baptist Church Institute in Dover, Tennessee. Last time we met together, we looked at the overview of the New Testament historical books. We gave three sections for the New Testament, historical books, Pauline epistles, and general epistles. And tonight we're going to come to the section of the Pauline epistles. As you can tell by the name, they are epistles written by the Apostle Paul. The 22 books of the New Testament remaining after a study of the historical books are all epistles. So after you get down to the book of Acts, it's epistles on throughout. Contrary to popular belief, an epistle is not the wife of an apostle. Uh, that was a joke, and you're allowed to laugh at that one. But uh, an epistle is uh, simply a letter. An epistle is a letter. It's a, just a more formal, uh, lengthier letter. Um, but that's, that's all it really is. So we use the word letter and epistle interchangeably. And of the 27 books of the New Testament, 22 are letters. 24, if you consider Luke and Acts as letters to Theophilus, though scholarly, we really don't, don't include them as such. Uh, so of these 22 epistles, 13 are unquestionably penned by the Apostle Paul, and these will be our focus in this lecture. Uh, the authorship of Hebrews is, of course, debated, and we will look at the discussion of this book in our next lecture. So bear with me. Uh, if, you, if you think Hebrews is a Pauline epistle, don't get too upset. We'll talk about it, but uh, to be scholarly accurate, we're going to consider it as a general epistle in our next session. So the Pauline epistles fall into two categories, fall into two categories. Nine of them are church epistles written to local assemblies. These would be the books of Romans down through the book of 2 Thessalonians. And four of them are personal epistles written to individuals. The three individuals are Titus, Timothy, and Philemon, but they make up the books of 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Um, before we jump into the contents of the Pauline epistles, let's do a quick character sketch of the Apostle Paul. In order to understand his writings, we must know some basic facts about his life. Paul is arguably the most important and prominent figure in the entire New Testament. Jesus accepted, of course. He was used of God to plant a plethora of churches all throughout the known world in the first century, and he wrote half of the books of the New Testament. So to say he's important is really an understatement. He was born both a Jew and a Roman citizen in the city of Tarsus. His Jewish name, which he was most often referred to prior to his conversion, was Saul. So Saul of Tarsus is Paul the Apostle. And Saul rose to notoriety as a Pharisee and became a very religious man. He was very religious. He said later that he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees and he was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, meaning that he was a studied Pharisee in the law and the languages and he was a studied Hebrew in religion and language. He spoke Hebrew and Greek and probably Latin as well. Um, some believe that Saul was a member of the Sanhedrin, which was a Jewish ruling body. He was present at the stoning of Stephen. Uh, so there's reason to believe that he was uh, in a position of leadership. And later, after his conversion, Saul, who would be called Paul, would use his background in Judaism, Roman citizenship, and his Greek culture all to his advantage. Now, God does not necessarily need to call someone uh, that has all of these natural advantages, but sometimes he is pleased to do so. And he definitely called Paul and used his natural advantages to the perfecting and promoting of his ministry. But sadly, in Paul's or Saul at this time, his misguided zeal that was not according to the knowledge of God, Saul was a fierce persecutor of the early church. And he fought hard against the spread of Christianity. In fact, it was at the, in the very act of traveling to persecute Christians in Damascus that Saul was converted by the sovereign grace of God. 
And the account of Saul's conversion is found for us in Acts chapter number 9. Acts 9 is where we see the story of Saul's conversion. And Saul would primarily go on to be referred to by his Roman name, Paul, and he would be instrumental in the development of the early church. Now, uh, we, we talk about Saul and Paul, and we need to make a clarification. He did not receive a name change. Some people think that his name was changed when God saved him. Well, that's not what happened at all. It's just Saul was his Jewish name, and Paul was his Roman name. And as an apostle to the Gentiles, it makes sense that he would go by his Roman name. Uh, if, if there's a man in America and his name is Stephen, well, if he goes to Greece, his name will be Stephanus, right? It's not a name change. It's just simply the difference between Jewish and Roman. So let's look at the theological and biblical significance of the Pauline epistles. The epistles differ from the historical books in that they present didactic teaching given by the Lord Jesus through His apostles. The reason why most all of your preaching that you hear will come from the epistles, most all of your systematic theology will be derived from the epistles, is that the epistles present doctrine in a very straightforward, direct, transparent manner. It's just didactic teaching. It's like reading an instruction manual as opposed to reading a narrative, right? Uh, and the epistles contain very little narrative. They're actually written as correspondence, as letters from one to another. So whereas we would learn by precept and by, uh, by story in the historical books, the way we would learn from the epistles is by Paul saying, I d d command you on behalf of God, do this. There's not much wiggle room when it's given that way. But again, just like we said for the Gospels, that doesn't mean that the epistles are any more inspired, just that they are perhaps more useful in light of certain circumstances and needs. Oftentimes, Paul wrote to answer specific questions and inquiries that were sent to him. I think of the Corinthian epistles, where he's dealing head-on with very specific subjects that he was personally asked to deal with. So as we read Paul's letters, we must never forget that all Paul wrote was under the inspiration of God. Uh, we, we, it's right, and I think that we should look at it that way, to study what we might call Pauline theology, to learn the character of Paul, to factor in the style of Paul as we are... Um, reading his letters to understand what he means. There's some literary devices and some things that are characteristic of the way Paul writes that we need to be aware of, but we don't need to think for a moment that uh, Paul's letters were his merely just his thoughts or his opinions from which we are free to disagree. Rather, they are the teachings of God, right? It was God working through Paul, but yet Paul maintained his personal characteristics and so we need to submit to the writings of the Apostle Paul, the ones that are contained in Scripture, that is. I'm sure Paul wrote other things. Think about this for a moment. Do you think the only things Paul wrote were the 13 books, or 14, depending on Hebrews, that are in the New Testament? No, absolutely not. It's just that those were the 13 that he wrote under the inspiration of God that were included in the canon. As a matter of fact, we know from studying the Corinthian epistles that Paul wrote at least one, probably two epistles to the Corinthian church that just were not under the inspiration of God and therefore not in the Bible, right? We don't have any historical record of them. I'm sure that's true for a lot of the biblical writers. Uh, that's what we need to understand about inspiration, right? Because of the nature of these writings, the epistles, as we said, they're a primary source for much of Christian theology as they explain the significance of the facts reported in the Gospels and Acts. So in the Gospels, we see just a lot of, here's what happened, here's what happened, but then in the epistles, we see, here's what that means. Right? So if we read just the Gospels, we would understand that Jesus died on the cross, and somehow that death accomplished salvation. We would understand that in a, in a rudimentary way, but we would not get much far beyond that. But then we read the epistles, and Paul tells us, under the inspiration of God, that 
On the cross, the sins of the elect were imputed to Christ and He legally secured their justification and He was delivered for their offenses and He was raised again for their justification and, and God was pouring out divine wrath upon the Lord Jesus and the Lord Jesus was accursed as a lawbreaker on the cross and He was saving all those who would believe on Him. And we see so much about the cross in these epistles and the intricacies of these doctrines would be nearly impossible to discern without the explanation provided in the epistles. That's why we say that one is not more important than the other. We need all of it, right? All Scripture is profitable. Let's look at the content of the Pauline epistles. Before we jump into the individual books, let me make a few preliminary considerations here. Paul's epistles fulfilled the specific assignment that he was given as an apostle. Paul was tasked with preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, right? Preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, apostles to the Gentiles, and revealing the mystery and the formation and the order of the New Testament church, which is the program of God in the New Covenant. So really revealing the whole New Covenant as a whole was something that the Apostle Paul was to do as a part of his ministry. Now, the normative structure of Paul's letters includes explanation, application, and instruction. So when we're reading Paul's letters, we, we should be on the lookout for this. Of course, he's going to give some type of greeting and salutation. I thank God for you, grace and peace unto you from uh, Jesus Christ and His Father. Right. So we see that, and then we see doctrine or uh, explanation. explanation, and then we see application, and it's application of the doctrine. And by the way, Paul is also modeling for us good preaching. We should preach it as he wrote it. Uh, he begins by saying, here's the doctrine, here's what the doctrine means, here's what, what I'm saying to you, here's what I mean, and then he's saying, and because of this, this is what you should do. This is the application for your life. And then a lot of his epistles, most all of them, end with specific instructions to the audience, to the church that he was um, writing to. Ends with instruction. Such things as receive Phoebe, she's a sister in the Lord, or I'm sending Timothy to you, be on the lookout for him, or take up a collection for this poor church over here in Jerusalem, right? Specific things, and uh, we might think that those aren't as, again, important, but they are. We need to learn from those things, perhaps in a different manner, right? But we need to learn from those things, and they also remind us that this is very real. Paul is a real person, and he's writing to real people, Real churches, right? Real struggles, real issues, real problems, real solutions, real, real gospel, right? And so that's what this portion of instruction reminds us of. Uh, we can see this uh, exemplified in the book of Romans. Paul begins Romans with a letter, right, to the saints which are at Rome. And then in chapters 1 through 11, he explains the doctrines of the gospel. The doctrine of sin, the doctrine of justification, the doctrine of sanctification, the doctrine of perseverance of the saints, the doctrine of election, right? He explains the doctrines of the gospel. Then in chapters 12 through 14, he applies the doctrines practically. It begins with chapter 12 and verse 1, that famous verse, you can probably quote it. I beseech you therefore, brethren. Well, what's the therefore? He's beseeching us, he's applying everything he said to us from chapters 1 through 11. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. This is application. This is something you need to do. This is not just, uh, for by grace are you saved, or this is not just, here's how justification works. No, this is, here's what you need to do in light of these truths. And then in chapters 15 through 16, he instructs the church on particular matters, such as his coming visit, Right? Individuals to receive in the church, individuals to avoid. That's all in the, the ending chapters. Ephesians is another good example of this. Um, chapters 1 through 3 are very doctrinal. Chapters 4 through 6 are very practical. Right? So we see Paul following this pattern in pretty much all of his letters. Let's look at the, the contents. Romans, as we, we've already stated, Romans was one of the most theologically significant books of the Bible. 
Romans is really, in a sense, the magnum opus of the Apostle Paul. It presents a very clear and a very emphatic presentation of soteriology and gospel truths. That is, the book of Romans. Uh, the book of First and Second Corinthians were very practical epistles, again, to deal with a church that was just steeped in issues. The Corinthian church had all sorts of problems. And Paul, in a spirit of love, but also in a, in a spirit of authority, comes to them and helps them sort through some of these issues. And in the first and second Corinthian epistles, you'll find a very sharp focus on ecclesiology. Very sharp focus on ecclesiology. Um, the book of Galatians, book of Galatians, stresses the seriousness of falling away from the true gospel. Falling away from the true gospel. You must understand that there can be no disagreement when it comes to the biblical gospel. There are things in the Bible that though you're wrong or you're right, but it doesn't mean that you're going to hell. Right? It doesn't mean that you're lost. Uh, though I think you should always strive to be right. I'm not minimizing doctrine. But there's things where honest and sincere believers can disagree upon and still maintain a charitable relationship. But there can be no disagreement on the central truths of the gospel. Galatians deals with the transition from the Old Covenant administration to the New Covenant administration. Paul talks about the true seed of Abraham and the types of the Old Testament ceremonial law and how all of this is driving us and pointing us to Christ. And we also in Galatians see the harmony of the law and the gospel. See how Paul says there's no contradiction between God's law in the Old Testament and what God is saying in the New Testament. There's no contradiction. If we think that there is, as I've said before in this class, the problem is not with the Bible. The problem is with you. Because Paul presents for us in Galatians that there is a seamless harmony between the law and the gospel. In the book of Ephesians, and let me say this, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon are considered prison epistles because Paul wrote them from a Roman jail cell. They're considered prison epistles. They're also considered Christological epistles because though they are relatively short books, they're jam-packed with the doctrine of Christ, especially that glorious book of Colossians there, chapter 1, just detailing the person of Christ, the person of Christ, who He is. Uh, so uh, with the book of Ephesians, Paul outlines the doctrines of grace and reconciliation and the believer's riches in Christ. Ephesians is heavy on positional truth. Who are you in Christ? What does that mean to be united and identified with Jesus? And Paul is there beseeching the church to walk in a manner consistent with God's grace. You see how he's explaining and applying? He says, here's who you are in Christ, therefore, here's how you need to live. In the book of Philippians, though Paul is suffering in prison, he demonstrates the abiding joy that can only be found in Christ. Um, we think we have problems. We think we have reasons to mope and complain. Well, Paul he details for us in the New Testament the beatings and the scourgings and the, the chastisement and the um, exiles that he had to go through. And yet that same man was the one who said, Rejoice always, again I say, rejoice. Because he understood something about the abiding joy of Christ. And he urges the Philippians to take on a Christ-like attitude towards hard providences. All, all things that come to pass in our lives are a result of God's providence. And some of those things are harder for us than others. And um, Paul is saying, no one experienced more hard providence than Jesus Christ. Because he, though being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation and he humbled himself even to the point of death, even the death on the cross. And he humbled himself and he died. No one has experienced hard providence like that. And yet Jesus, Hebrews says, who for the joy that was set before him. right? So Paul is saying you need to take on this Christ-like attitude towards the events that happen in your life. The book of Colossians speaks in great deal on Christological truth and again the believer's position in Christ. First and second Thessalonians, Paul is encouraging this church with as an example for other churches. So Paul is commending the Thessalonian church. He's, he's very pleased with a lot of the things he sees taking place in that assembly. 
And uh, he deals also in that epistle with some eschatological or end times truths. And he provides them with the motivation to stand firm in the face of persecution. Uh, if you're jotting these down, you're getting a really good overview of the New Testament epistles. Those are his church epistles. Now we're going to look a little bit at his personal epistles. Uh, there are four of them, First and Second Timothy, both written to Timothy. Uh, Paul issues the instructions there. Uh, they're, they're heavy, of course, on uh, ecclesiastical truth, church truth, because Timothy and Titus were both pastors. And he's writing there. They're, these are the personal epistles. Uh, Timothy and Titus are also referred to as the pastoral epistles. And Paul issues the church instructions for elders. We find there the qualifications upon those who hold the office of elder. We find Paul uses elder, pastor, and bishop as interchangeable words. But men who are to be um, ordained by the laying on of hands by the congregation must meet these qualifications in the Scriptures. Uh, these books are immensely practical for dealing with the day-to-day -day life of the New Testament church. You, you find that the just the normal problems that we face, because any time, I don't care if we're redeemed, any time you put a, a group of sinners together, there's going to be problems. And Paul knew all about that. God knew all about that. And so he writes these epistles to help Timothy in these struggles. Paul also encourages Timothy to continue in the work as his own death is fastly approaching. 2 Timothy is the last book that Paul wrote. He wrote it from a cell right before he was executed. And he even says in the last chapter there of 2 Timothy that the time of his departure is at hand, that he's fought a good fight, that he's kept the faith. And so uh, we, we read that and we don't, we don't you know, we... Uh, we don't sense the gravity of it, but could you imagine? Here you are, you're a young pastor, and your mentor, your father in the faith, is writing you a letter telling you that he is about to be killed for the cause of Christ, and he's encouraging you to keep on and to press on. I think that would encourage me to continue on in the ministry that God had appointed me to. In the book of Titus, uh, he reiterates many of the instructions given to Timothy. A lot of that is just one-to-one -one ratio. And again, that doesn't mean that somehow the Bible is uh, not infallible. It's just Paul is writing to Titus and Timothy. Chances are Titus never read the letters to Timothy, and Timothy never read the letters to Titus, but Paul needed to communicate the same information. And uh, Titus aids Timothy in, uh, or well, Paul, or excuse me, Titus, aids the Apostle Paul in the planning and establishing of churches in pagan culture. And he was specifically, at the time of the writing of the epistle there, he was being sent to the area of Crete to set in order the things that were lacking, as it says in Titus 1, and to ordain elders in the churches. That was his, his goal. He was not meant to necessarily stay in one place for very long, uh, but he was to go and he was to ordain leadership. And so what we find in these pastoral epistles is also how we are to approach the work of church planting in an anti-gospel culture. Very important for us. Philemon is a little different. Philemon is a very unique epistle. Uh, it's written on a very specific occasion. And it's not necessarily uh, focusing on the teaching of doctrinal truths, though that is there. So what's going on in Philemon? Well, Philemon was a leader in the Colossian church. He's a leader in the Colossian church, and at that time the church was meeting in his home. And he had a runaway slave named Onesimus. And this runaway slave had apparently stolen from Philemon and run away, and he ran into the Apostle Paul. So there again we see the providence of God in all of this. And upon running into the Apostle Paul, I don't know if it was through Paul's preaching or just through personal conversation, but apparently Onesimus was converted. And so Paul sends Onesimus back to Philemon. He says, go back to Philemon. And he charges Philemon in this letter to receive him as a brother. <clears throat> and then he goes on to say that any debt that Onesimus assumed was to be charged to Paul's account. So anything, Paul's writing, Philemon says, look, I, I ran into Onesimus, your slave, and I'm going to send him back to you. And anything that he stole from you, anything that, uh, that, 
he owes you, just put it on my account. Forgive him, receive him as a brother, don't punish him, uh, just love him. And so we see here practical truths on how we are to deal, even with the slavery issue, uh, but also we see that um, Paul models for us the doctrines of reconciliation as this rebel, this lawbreaker, this thief is being reconciled to his master, just as we who are rebels and lawbreakers and thieves are reconciled unto God. And also we see the doctrine of substitutionary atonement. What did the Lord Jesus do? The Lord Jesus came and sought us, and he found us, and he said to his heavenly Father, he said, I'm sending this child to you. Anything that he has occurred, any debt, any sin payment, put that on my account. And Jesus went and paid that account on the cross of Calvary. So Philemon is just a beautiful book that paints these truths for us. So these are the Pauline epistles, and they are tantamount to biblical and systematic theology. They, they must be studied. They must be understood. They aid in explaining other portions of Scripture, and they provide us with the most straightforward and explicit doctrinal instruction for Christians in the New Testament. So this is the Pauline epistles, and when we meet together, we will finish up BI 101 with our study of the general epistles. Thank you, and God bless you.